In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. Y el cordero y el potro estarán junto a león seguros, y un niño los guiará a todos. Ngombe na dubu watalala pamoja, watoto wao watalala pamoja, na simba atakula majani kama ngombe. Ek burgo aplo hat, sor paje golin hat galta, ani hoy o burgo da biakul sor paje hatin galta sana teka surup kainz kori na, jese ham chen. पवित्र दोंगरा रामी आसलर आमका काई जावचे ना जेसे उदोक अपने समदिरांत बोत्ता तेज भाषेन आमी देवाक पडेल्यार आमका सोगली लोक आमी ब्याकुळान दियेतिली सिकु हियो मृति व किती च एनजि च दाउदी अटकुआ बेंडेरा य वकोवो क्व उलिमेंगु वोटे इला नेशनस से रुनिरान कोनेल इला तेरा दोंदे विवे Estará un lugar glorioso. Namahali pake pa kumzika patakuwa na utukufu. Suim dio wasa tuin kushalka yasab. And the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, your facilities team. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> They've been telling me all week that they were going to moonwalk off the stage. Thank you, Richard. That was beautiful. Oh, my goodness. I love them so much. And I can tell by your faces that you love them as much as I do. Our facilities team here at Grace is an example of what it means to be a united, multicultural force within the kingdom of God. They reflect the glory of God, don't they? They reflect the, the glory of God. To me... They just do. They just do, and I'll tell you why. It's because they exemplify to me what the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. referred to as the beloved community. They're part of the beloved community. This band of brothers does it all, and they do it all together. They work diligently, and they work with joyful hearts. Many of you already know that when one of these guys stops you in the lobby and asks you how you're doing, they genuinely want to know how you are doing. Love for God, love for God's people, and love for each other flows out of our facilities team like a natural wellspring. It isn't contrived. They don't have to fake it. It's just the natural outflow of the love that they have for Jesus, and it's evidence of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of them. Love is the hallmark of our facilities team, and that love speaks volumes to me every day. Jason Mitchell, our senior director of facilities, had this to say of his team earlier this week. He said, we all have unique personalities, and we don't always agree on things. However, we respect one another. We cover for one another, and we pray for each other. We're real with each other and truly friends, truly friends. There's so much power in that statement alone. That is Isaiah 11 in a nutshell. The prophecy that they just read to us in many languages comes to us from Isaiah chapter 11. It speaks of the coming Messiah, the heir to David's throne, how he would be a banner of salvation to all the world, to the whole world. This promised Messiah would bring about a kind of justice and peace that hadn't been seen in the world since the Garden of Eden. Think about it. In what kind of a world does a leopard snuggle up with a baby goat or a lion eat hay like a cow? Or, or that cow feels like it can graze peacefully next to a bear, and the babies of that cow and that bear, the cub and the calf, they're over here just taking a nap together, Isaiah says, while a human baby is over here petting a cobra, and everything is peaceful. Isaiah 11 is a wildly provocative picture of perfect unity and harmony. What we see here defies our understanding of the very laws of nature. These unique creatures, historically hostile toward one another, are seen here respecting one another. 
the wolf and the lamb dwelling together. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, Isaiah writes. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. In that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Why did God speak through the prophet Isaiah using this kind of illustration, all these diverse creatures coming together and living in harmony? Simply put, it's because we are God's creations. And when we come together, we reflect the many facets of his glory. When his creation comes together, his glory fills the whole earth. So the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord, Isaiah said. And the land will be glorious, a glorious place when the nations rally to him. This has been the plan all along. For God to display his glory through the diversity of his people living in peace and unity and respecting one another, the nations would come together under Jesus, under the heir to David's throne, as Isaiah said, and he would be a banner of salvation to all the world. That was the plan. So what happened? I look around and I don't see the nations all rallying together to Jesus under the banner of the heir to David's throne. I don't see the wolf and the lamb dwelling together. I see coyotes. Last week, Last week in my own backyard, my son took this video of a coyote eating its breakfast, devouring this poor squirrel, ripping the poor thing to shreds. Y'all, I don't live in a prophetic Eden-like utopia. I live in Fishers, Indiana. So what happened? Did God abandon his plan? Did the plan change? Thank you, son, for that video. Did, Did the plan change? Or is that plan still in motion? If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 11, and that's on page 978 in the House Bible. While you're turning there, I want to say welcome to all of you that are out there joining us online. Uh, My in-laws watch every week from Chicago, so special hello to you guys and everybody else that's out there. And welcome, of course, to all of you guys who came to church today. Thank you for being here to worship together. Thank you for choosing to come together this morning. It's good to see you all here. All right, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to dig in. Lord God, you have already been here. You are here. You are moving in our midst. Lord, you've, you've drawn us near to you already through the act of musical worship and giving as worship. And now, Lord, I preach as worship. Lord, would you just speak through your word, your eternal word. Use me as your vessel and just speak. Have your way in this service. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're in Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to start with a little background. The Apostle Paul had helped to establish the Ephesian church during his third missionary journey. He lived as a missionary in Ephesus for a little over two years, so he knew a lot about the culture of the place and the challenges that the church there was facing. Ephesus was a very important city in ancient Greece. It was famous for its Temple of Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This massive temple and the worship of Artemis, who was the Greek goddess of fertility, this meant big business and notoriety to this prominent city. But there was also a substantial Jewish population living in Ephesus. And remember, to these ancient Jews, there were two types of people in the world. There were Jews and everybody else. If you were not Jewish, you were considered a Gentile, and Gentiles were considered to be unclean outsiders. Jews had no business associating with Gentiles. They were considered heathens. So Ephesus was a city divided between devout Jews on one side and pagan Gentiles on the other. This is who Paul was sharing the good news of Jesus with when he lived as a missionary in Ephesus for those two years. The church that formed there in Ephesus was made up of converted Jews and 
converted Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles who now both professed faith in Christ Jesus. These people, these cultures, had never come together in this way. Never. They had been strangers, even hostile toward one another, but now they were becoming the church. Can you imagine for a moment what it must have been like for this multi-ethnic, multicultural community of believers to suddenly have to come together with all their vastly different ideas and with their cultural differences, so many cultural differences between them and centuries of water under the bridge. These cultures weren't just different, they were naturally opposed to one another. It was a legitimate culture clash. There was hostility between these cultures. In fact, Paul wrote this very letter to the Ephesians while he was in Roman custody. He was imprisoned because he had been accused of bringing a Gentile into the Jewish temple. To the Jews, the defilement of the temple by bringing a Gentile into their house of worship, this defilement was tantamount to treason and punishable by death. Jews and Gentiles just did not worship together. They were kept separate from each other, even and especially in their worship. A thick wall was constructed around the temple for the sole purpose of keeping Gentiles out. There were even strongly worded do not enter signs that were etched into that wall. Signs that read in both Greek and Latin so that the Gentiles would be sure to understand, you foreigners, they warned, no foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught, I love this, on himself shall he put blame for the death which will ensue. Hostile. There was a literal wall of hostility built to divide the Jews from any foreigners. And that is what brings us to Ephesians chapter 2. So let's look at what Paul had to say to this blended church in Ephesus. Ephesians 2.11, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days you were living apart from Christ, you were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Paul writes to the church that he helped establish his beloved community in Ephesus to remind them that Gentile believers are not to be considered outsiders anymore. Because of the resurrection, this multi-ethnic community of believers had been brought together under the banner of of Jesus, the heir to David's throne, just like Isaiah had prophesied. Paul continues in verse 14, Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He's talking about that wall, the wall that went around the temple, the literal wall of hostility that separated Jews and Gentiles. Through his victorious death and resurrection, he broke down that dividing wall. And how did he do it? He did this, verse 15, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Remember those dire threats that had been etched in two languages into the temple wall, those threats that threatened any foreigner, any Gentile who dared to cross that boundary and enter the temple, that they would be put to death? Now, By means of Christ's own death on the cross, not only is that dividing wall no longer necessary, but look at what has been put to death 
in verse 16. Our hostility toward each other has been put to death. Now we can be one people created anew in Christ Jesus. He brought this good news of peace, verse 17. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. This temple imagery is everywhere in this passage. The old wall of hostility has been torn down, and now what stands in its place? You, you Christ followers, are now the very walls of a new kind of temple that God is building, a place for his glory, his dwelling, his spirit to dwell. You are being built up together, brick by diverse brick, to form a temple where God himself chooses to dwell. And why? Because we are God's creations. And when we come together, we reflect the many facets of his glory. When his creation comes together, his glory fills the earth. This has been the plan from the very beginning. Paul says it a little later on in the same letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 3.10, God's purpose in all of this, his purpose was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety. To all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, this was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the plan, his eternal plan, to display his wisdom in its rich variety. I love that phrase that Paul uses here, in its rich variety. Variety. Chris, Chris Ramsey, it is time. Chris, Chris is always waiting for my dictionary moment. You're going to get one from me probably every time. This is my new favorite Greek word, y'all, okay? It's polupoikilos. Polupoikilos. Paul uses this word to describe God's wisdom, polupoikilos. It literally means of differing colors. To describe his wisdom in its differing colors colors. Polypoikilos comes from many, polis, which means many, and poikilos, which means ultra diverse. Not just diverse, ultra diverse. Put those two words together and we get a word, polypoikilos, that means with multitudinous expressions or facets. I hope you're following me. This is God's divine plan, and it has been from the very beginning for his church to display his wisdom in its multitudinous expressions and facets and colors. For his church to exhibit his wisdom in all of its differing colors and ultra diversity. And this is where we are today. From the earliest days of the church right up until now, we are being carefully joined together in him, brick by diverse brick, becoming his church, a holy temple, a place where the spirit of God dwells and his glory is on display, his church that radiates his wisdom in all of its differing colors and facets, his church where the nations come together and bring their languages and bring their uniqueness and rally to him a family that is ultra diverse. We are his church and through our shared lives, he is constructing the very temple in which his spirit still dwells. Isaiah said the land where he lives will be a glorious place. Dwayne Elmer wrote in his book, Cross-Cultural Conflict, diversity is rooted in the creative activity of God. But one wonders why 
For what reason did God display such variety in his human and plant and animal and inorganic world? It is my conviction that only in this immense and grand variety could we begin to capture the character, grace, and glory of God. Put another way, God cannot adequately be revealed in a creation of similarities. God cannot adequately be revealed in a creation of similarities, of sameness. And so he builds his ultra-diverse church, his beloved community of differing colors and languages and cultures and backgrounds to better reflect his multifaceted glory to the whole world. This is his plan, and his plan is still in motion. Even though we have failed to live out this plan time and time and time again and over centuries and centuries. This is still his plan. We are God's creations, and when we come together, we reflect the many facets of his glory. I want to bring it real close to home. I went back and I did a little research because when I first came here to Grace Church, there was a poster down the hallway that leads to the care center It was the poster uh, of an old sermon series that our founding senior pastor, Dave Rodriguez, preached back in November of 2013. It was the Becoming Us series. Some of you who were here back then might remember that series. It was called Becoming Us, and Dave, as always, had some pretty provocative things to say in that sermon series back in 2013. He said, for centuries, we have been in non-compliance with the Bible. Now, some of y'all already know, but Dave Rodriguez does not mince words. He just lets it, he lets it fly. He said, for centuries, we have been in noncompliance with the Bible. We are stuck in cages of homogeneity. Then he quoted Christina Cleveland from her book, Disunity in Christ, where she wrote, Our homogeneity is like a cage surrounding our group, preventing us from becoming familiar with culturally different others. Our homogeneity is a cage. That sounds to me like a dividing wall of hostility for the modern age. And in November of 2013, Dave Rodriguez implored us to bust out of those cages He said, coming together under the throne of Jesus Christ is not a homogenized group of people who lose their distinctions. No, it is every race, every nation, every group of people in all of their glory and their wonder coming together in diversity and wonder around the cross of Jesus Christ. Dave said, it's time that we get into compliance with the word of God. It's time that we become the beloved community. That was 2013. Fast forward four years, from 2013 to 2017. It was my first year here at Grace Church, and the first time I ever encountered the phrase homogenous unit principle. I was in a meeting where we were discussing uh, different strategies of church growth, different approaches to local evangelism. Homogenous is a word that means consisting of parts that are all the same. The homogenous unit principle of church growth suggests that homogenous churches, that is churches that are made up of demographically similar people, similar race, similar language, similar socioeconomic status, churches of sameness grow faster because they're more accommodating to people who might feel uncomfortable crossing racial, cultural, linguistic, or class barriers. In a rapidly globalizing world and in a rapidly diversifying zip code here in Hamilton County, I am glad that we were having these conversations. These conversations were very important to have. We wrestled with these ideas, knowing that in some ways, yes, it's easier for a church to grow quickly when things are kept the same, when there's one language in music, in sermons, in signage, around your church? When there's one style of music, it's easier to relate to people who share your tastes and your preferences to everything from sermon style to music style to clothing style to carpet color. 
And churches all over the country were employing this homogenous unit principle, and many of them were growing. So the question to us in 2017 was, should we follow suit? Is that who God is calling us to be? Sameness as a growth strategy does appear to be working elsewhere, but is that who God is calling us to be as a church? Smash cut to November of that year. It was fall of 2017, and I had the opportunity to attend a multicultural worship leaders conference in Baltimore, Maryland. Shout out to my friend, my co-pastor, friend and co-pastor Jeff Unruh, who was my boss at the time. Jeff discovered that such a conference existed, and he thought it would be really helpful to us as an ever-diversifying church congregation uh, for us to go and to learn from this conference. It was one of those conferences where they give you a notebook. A notebook, I tried to kill that fly, y'all. A notebook <laughs> where we could write down notes throughout all of the sessions. And I've gone back to this notebook time and time and time again over the years. I'm still struck by how God was preparing my own heart back in 2017. I wrote things like, authenticity is both who we are, who we are right now, and who we are becoming. Authenticity is a both and. So set the table for who is here and for who is coming. That's what I wrote down. I also wrote, we protest by worshiping together. We protest racism and hatred and separateness and divisions and prejudices and evil. We protest by worshiping together. Every people, every tribe, every tongue, there's power in our protest, power in our unity, and power when the church comes together under the banner of Jesus Christ. I wrote, don't be afraid, be brave, which reminded me of another classic Dave Rodism, be brave, not safe. The homogenous unit principle is a fairly safe way to grow a church, but we were being challenged to be brave and not safe. Existing as an intentional multicultural church body might just be the slowest way to grow a church. But based on what we see in Ephesians and in Isaiah and all over the Bible, it might just be the most biblical. Diversity is not a church growth strategy. It's not about numbers. It's about remaining faithful to God's eternal plan because we are God's creations. And when we come together, we reflect the many facets of his glory. We are busting out of our cages of homogeneity and getting into compliance with God's word. On the flight home from that conference, I wrote right here in this journal, right here where it says, begin airplane reflections. <laughs> I wrote, for the nations, for your glory, for the purpose, make every effort. The purpose. Remember Ephesians 3.10, the purpose, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety, multitudinous, ultra-diversity. Use the church. And then I drew this sign I was struck at that moment that even the language on the aircraft was bilingual. And I wrote, we can't deny it or avoid it. We live in a multicultural world. And then a still small voice, the voice of the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart in the form of a question. And that question was simple. He said to me in November of 2017, do you want in? Do you want in? Exactly four years to the month after Dave preached the Becoming Us series, in that moment on the plane in November, I sensed the Spirit say, do you want in? The mantle is extended to grace. It is an invitation. Do you want in? A mantle is a biblical term that means the call of God or the gift of God, the purpose of for which God has called us. The mantle, the gift, the call, the purpose has been extended to Grace Church. 
And it's an invitation. We're being invited. Do you want in? Right then, I saw in my mind's eye that Becoming Us poster that was down the hallway, that series poster, and again the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, you've already been told. I already told you that you were becoming us, meaning you, meaning us, Grace Church. He already told us we have been being invited. We have been being shaped and formed, uniquely gifted and called to become the kind of ultra-diverse, ultra-diverse, glorious temple where God dwells by his Holy Spirit, where there is no dividing wall of hostility, where brick by uniquely diverse brick, we are being carefully joined together in him in order to display his wisdom in its rich variety to reflect his glory to the community around us and to the world and to the unseen rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This has been God's eternal plan to make his temple glorious, to fill the earth with his glory through the shared lives of you, his people, and your devotion, your shared devotion to him. We are God's creations, and when we come together, we reflect the many facets of his glory. Many of us would, would answer yes to that question. Do you want in? The invitation still stands. Do you want in? And many of us would say, yes, put me in, coach. I want in. But there's a part of us that also realizes that it's like what Barry said last week over and over again. Cross-cultural work is hard. It can be challenging for us to make room for other cultures because it pushes us out of our comfort zones. A very dear, very self-aware, very honest friend shared this with me earlier this week. She said, I'm afraid to enter into other cultures because I'm afraid of being offensive on accident. So real, so real. I'm afraid of being offensive on accident. Doing different things or trying new things makes me uncomfortable because I'm so awkward and picky. I love that she said she was picky. I've called her the tater tot queen. <laughs> she knows who she is. She's picky. Basically, she said, it's hard because of my feelings. And clearly, that's not the right mindset, but it's where I'm at. I am so grateful for a friend like that. I'm so grateful that my friend was brave enough to be honest and vulnerable about where she feels insecure and uncomfortable navigating these cross-cultural waters. We've got to be real with each other. We've got to stop hiding. We've got to be willing to be vulnerable with each other and respect each other's vulnerabilities, respect each other's honesty. We've got to make room for one another. It's got to start here. Make room for each other. I believe wholeheartedly that the honesty in my friend's question brings glory to God and helps to beautify his temple, and here's why. My friend was not complaining. She was confessing, and I needed to hear her heart because this multicultural thing comes relatively easy to me. It's easy for me to embrace because of my own background, my own diverse background, my mixed race, my love of different languages, my love of all kinds of food. I love to sing in Spanish. I love to sing in all kinds of languages when I have the chance. My favorite worship band sings in Hindi. This comes pretty easily to me. I've had a very unique life with very unique life experiences that have given me this passion I have for multicultural and cross-cultural ministry. But my friend's honest and raw reflection gave me pause because she helped me realize that this doesn't come easy to most people. So what are the things that make it difficult? What are the things that make it hard for us to make room for other cultures, and what can we do about that? Language can be a barrier. Worldviews and mindsets like Barry talked about last week, even concepts of time. Tastes, palates, preferences, our own comfort zones, all of these things can be a barrier like a dividing wall. But if it's true that Christ broke down that dividing wall and that he is carefully joining us together, all of God's holy people together in him, if that is true, I ask the Holy Spirit then to show me, what am I missing here? How is this possible? 
What am I missing? Give me a picture. And he did. He gave me a picture in my head of a brick wall. That's what I saw, brick and mortar. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me in that moment, I'm no brick mason, please forgive me, but I felt him say in that moment that Jesus is the cornerstone and the Holy Spirit that oozes out. The Holy Spirit is the mortar. He then took me back to Ephesians 2.20 to show me what he meant. Ephesians 2.20, together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him becoming a temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives. How? By his spirit. No other way. By his spirit. How is it possible? Is it when we all learn each other's languages? That's not enough. It's by his spirit. The Holy Spirit makes it possible. Jesus is the cornerstone and the Holy Spirit is the mortar. Mortar is the thing that hardens to bind building materials together and create strong and sturdy structures. The Holy Spirit binds us together firmly as we are carefully joined together in Christ. Mortar helps to spread the weight of the bricks evenly. The Holy Spirit is the great equalizer. The spirit we share brings balance and levels the playing field. When the spirit of God lives in us, we will each think of the other as better than himself or herself. We'll think of the other as better than ourselves and distribute the weight of power evenly so that everyone flourishes, so that the whole body can be healthy and growing and full of love, Ephesians 4. Mortar fills and seals, I love this, It fills and seals the irregular gaps between bricks. No two bricks are exactly alike, just as no two humans are exactly alike. That means that there will always be the potential for an awkward gap between humans. Always. But the Holy Spirit fills in those gaps. The Holy Spirit binds and unifies. God knows that we're just bricks. He knows that we are imperfect. He knows that we're not exactly alike. And yet, as the master builder, I'm sure that he took that into consideration when he chose to use each one of us as the building material for his temple where his spirit will dwell, the spirit of unity through the bond of peace. Mortar is sometimes used to add decorative colors or patterns to masonry walls. The Holy Spirit beautifies. We are unique. Our languages, our cultures, our perspectives, perceptions, worldviews, we are vastly different in our tastes and our preferences. Yes, we are different, but isn't that exactly his point? He said in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And he inaugurated that on the day of Pentecost when he gave us his Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit binds, the Holy Spirit levels, the Holy Spirit fills and seals, the Holy Spirit strengthens and gives power to all of us to reflect that ultra diversity of his wisdom. As we are carefully joined together in him, the Holy Spirit gives us the ability, as on the day of Pentecost, to hear one another. The Holy Spirit makes us one. We are God's creations, and when we come together, we reflect the many facets of his glory. This is still the plan. From ancient times until now, God's purpose is to use the church to display his wisdom in all its rich variety. The mantle, the gift, the invitation has been extended to you And I will ask you what he asked me in 2017. Do you want in? Do you want in? I close with this. It's a quote from the book, Worship Together, Your Church as in Heaven. It's by Josh Davis and Nikki Lerner. And by the way, I did put a couple of links to a couple of books that I have found really helpful along these, uh, the subject line of being a multicultural, worshiping, unified family of God. There's a couple of links in the Grace Church app. Check those out if you want to go deeper. But I close with this. If we only surround ourselves with believers who look like us, 
we can subconsciously begin to think that God looks like us. If we only worship with believers who speak our language, we can forget that God is the creator of the languages of the world. If we only worship with believers who like the same Bible verses we like, we can forget that the rest of the Bible exists for our correction, reproof, training, and equipping. If we consistently remain in our comfort zones, our God becomes increasingly small. But when we surround ourselves with Christians of different colors and sizes, we realize that we are all made in God's image and he is not made in ours. When we worship with believers who speak different languages, we realize that one language is not sufficient to describe our God. It is important that we stretch ourselves because it helps us realize that our God is bigger than we can imagine. We are God's creations, and when we come together, we reflect the many facets of his glory. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you did not change the plan, your eternal plan. I'm humbled, Lord God, that you would still choose to use us imperfect human beings to be the very building material of the place where your spirit would choose to dwell in us and among us. Holy Spirit, I pray now that you would come and endow us fresh and anew with your power to make us one. Ooze from us, Lord God, like mortar can ooze from a brick. Beautify us, Lord God, as you build us carefully together to form your temple. Right now, Lord God, as our praises go up, would the walls come down, the walls of hostility that still exist between us. God, we confess that we're trying, but we confess that it's hard and we don't always know how to do it. But in our humility, there's even more room for your Holy Spirit to come and fill. You said that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. And you promised that in the last days you would pour out your spirit on all flesh. So do it now. Do it now as we worship together, as we protest together in our worship together. Build your church. Make us your temple. And fill us with your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching, but don't stop there. We want you to find community at Grace Church, and the first step in doing that is going to gracechurch.us slash hub. There you'll find other sermons, details about upcoming events, and other important announcements. And make sure you subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out when we post something new. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.